So I'm on, I got the privilege and the honor of bringing the last um, chapter of our Attitude series. So um, Rob started off with the Attitude of Gratitude, and he was saying that attitudes are, oh gosh, I had it in my head before, it's gone. Anyway, he had some really cool, funky, fruitful jam things. Um, yeah, everyone remembers that. That's Rob, like it's signature Rob, some really cool little things. So that was awesome. So he started off with Attitude of Gratitude, and then Gary did Attitude of Latitude. And my one is Attitude Determines Altitude. And as you can hear, I got a flu last night, and I'm like, oh my gosh. Um, so bear with me, this voice is just going to be the way it is. Sorry, man. Um, okay, so I thought we'd start off with this. Um, attitude is a settled way of thinking or feeling about something. All right, and, and quite often we hear about attitudes like, oh, that person has an attitude. You've got an attitude problem. But in fact, everybody has an attitude. Everybody has an attitude. Um, it is good, it is bad, whatever. Everybody has an attitude because it's, a, it's, it's basically the way we think and feel about something being expressed. Right? Um, and on a plane, we have what we call an attitude indicator, okay? And so the attitude indicator on a plane, what it does is it it will indicate where the plane is on the horizon in terms of the horizon. So once when a plane, when they say nose up on the attitude indicator on the aeroplane, it means that the um, aeroplane is above the horizon. And when they say nose down on the aeroplane, it means that the um, yeah, aeroplane is below the horizon. So it's all based on the hor horizon line. So I thought we could use that as a little example for us, right? So like, um, let's say that the horizon is average, all right? And I'm not gonna live about an average life if I have about an average attitude, right? And, and I need to keep checking my attitude indicator to see where I sit, uh, whether I am nose up, which means above the horizon, which means that I'm actually excelling and doing really well based on my attitude, or that I am nose down and I'm going below the radar, I'm below the horizon, and I'm not actually living up to my potential. See, attitude is like that. Attitude really can determine our altitude because the way we think or feel about something means that this is the way we're going to behave in certain situations. So I had a look at this, this article when I asked mum about it because she's a counsellor and she talks about core beliefs and values and stuff like that. Um, and I don't have this up here, but it said basically that attitude is your beliefs plus your values equals your attitude, and out of your attitude comes your behaviour. So attitude is very, very important and how we live our life. And if we have a bad attitude, it's kind of, it will determine uh, whether or not we, we make it all the way because God has promises and plans for every single one of us. Um, and some people live those out and some people don't. It's not that the potential is not there. It's that the attitude towards it can sometimes be one of, uh, like a bad one. And we're going to go into different attitudes now, but there could be many things. But what, I think it's good for us to sometimes stop and think, like the attitude indicator on the plane, am I nose up or nose down? Because the thing with attitudes is we all have them, um, but we can also change them, right? So if we have a bad attitude, if we realize, hey, I'm nose down right now, um, I can adjust the settings, and that's what the pilot does. They adjust the plane so that they can be nose up if that's where they need to be, right? Okay. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> I did my slides bad again. Sorry, guys. It's not my specialty. Um, so I thought an attitude of humility is probably a good place to start, right? Um, and does anyone know what this picture reference is? Anybody? It is. The iron and the silver, yeah. So this is from the book of Daniel. Um, so I just put that reference up there because Nebuchadnezzar, King Nebuchadnezzar was one of those people who was a very, he was a very powerful man. He, he, he lived a really great life. He actually made it above the horizon, but his attitude once he got there was one of, I did this, I'm great, instead of God did this, God's great. And so that's the thing with humility. If we have a humble attitude, the Bible says that, that God exalts those who humble themselves. And then he says, and I humble those who exalt themselves. You know, it's that upside down kingdom that God does. Like in the world, you go and you try to get self-promotion and people do whatever they can to get wherever they need to be. But it's very different in the kingdom. In the kingdom, you need to go low to go high. And so humility is where we start. A humble heart, a place of humility and position is, is the best thing in God's eyes. 
And so I just thought, what, what would it look like if we have a humble attitude? It means that we would apologize when necessary. And I put in brackets, it will be necessary because who here has not made a mistake? You know? Thanks, Dave. I knew you put your hand up. Just keeps it fun. Um, <laughs> everyone's made a mistake, right? A humble attitude understands that when I mess up, it has an effect on people around me, and I should apologize. I don't have to apologize, but a humble attitude that honors others above myself thinks, I wonder how my actions, this mistake, has uh, impacted those around me. And so with an attitude of humility, I'm going to say, I want to make this right. I want to apologize to these people because I care about these people. I'm going to honor them above myself. I'm not too proud to say sorry. I have a humble attitude, and I know it will be necessary. I'm going to take the necessary steps to remain in that position in my heart. Um, and First Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Um, and I love that scripture because, you know, it always, God is always at the top, right? So, so when we have to humble ourselves in, li- in life, and sometimes it may be apologizing to someone, what we will do is we will look at the someone and we forget that we're doing it for someone, you know? And like, if I realize, actually, um, maybe I don't want to, you know, make this right, but I want to be right with him. So, so that attitude of heart, changes this one you know it's like okay God is this what you want me to do I'm going to humble myself under your mighty hand and I'm going to do what you ask me to do because you know what's best for me I might not see the fruit immediately but it's it's yeah it's my choice to honor you in this um and yeah honoring one another above yourselves is humble and also knowing you're not a finished product and you will make mistakes along the way I think that's a humble A humble thing to understand that, you know, you're not going to be perfect. You get into leadership, you probably won't be perfect straight away either. Whatever it is, wherever God's taking you, the higher you get, the higher the expectations, you're going to mess up, but be humble enough to say sorry. Anyway, I'm just saying leadership because altitude is up, right? But anyway, it could be anything. Oh, this is doing it again. All right, so failure. What is our attitude towards failure in life? Okay. Because my attitude towards failure in life determines how far I can go. And I've got a couple of guys up here, Albert Einstein and Thomas Edison, all right? These guys are geniuses written about in the history books. Um, And Albert Einstein said, anyone who has never made a mistake has never tried anything new. So if our attitude towards failure is, I don't want to fail, I'm too scared of failing, well then we're never going to step out and actually get above the horizon because our attitude to life is is one of, um, you know, fear of failure is quite common. But the people that actually do succeed in this life and go far are the ones that have a different attitude to failure. And he said, anyone who's never made a mistake has never tried anything new. And this is Einstein. He, he's, like I said, written about in the history books. He's a genius. And then Thomas Edison says, many of life's failures are people who did not realize how close they were to success when they gave up. You know, like trying and trying and trying again, you know, having that perseverance and failure, like... I might not have gotten it right then, but I can get it right now. And we've got our beautiful scripture here in Proverbs that says the righteous may fall seven times, but still get up. You know, he's saying righteous people fall, but they get back up. Proverbs twenty four sixteen. So if I have a good attitude towards failure, I'm going to understand that there is trial and error in anything I do in life. I might not succeed straight away. It doesn't mean I am a failure. It just means I failed, right, at one time. And, and what we can do with failure is we can say, what can I learn from that? What did I just experience? What went wrong there? Um, how can I readjust? Because it's, it's these people in life that have made it so far because they kept looking at it from a different perspective of problem solving, right? They wanted to solve the problem. They wanted to um, find a good thing. So here we go. I didn't fail 10,000 times. I found 10,000 ways that didn't work. And that comes from Thomas Edison, Okay. What a great perspective, right? His attitude to failure was like, I didn't fail 10,000 times. I just found ways that don't work. And then in the end, he found the way that did work. And aren't we grateful for it? He's an awesome dude. So our attitude towards failure um, is on us as well. And yeah, it determines how far we go. Sorry about these. Okay, remaining teachable. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Let your good spirit lead me on level ground. Um, so if we're remaining teachable, it means that we're being a student of the Word, right? The Bible. 
Um, you know, how many times there have been things happen in my life where I'm like, if I didn't have that supernatural perspective of it, I could see it at face value and I could be completely derailed by it, right? But then when I look at the Word of God and I understand seeing things from God's perspective, I get the insight I need to um, stand in this situation, right? Because I've been a student of the Word. Now, if you don't read the Word, you don't know what it says. So when times get rough, um, you won't know what His promises are. And I was saying this to the boys the other day, like, you know, our teenagers, got a couple of, you know, I've got a teenager and then my brother's a teenager and then my nephew. So, you know, those who were talking about it, and I said, you know, when you read the Word of God sometimes, it's not always going to be like, God is speaking, you know, um, and God is speaking to you clearly, and man, he just spoke to me about this. Sometimes that will happen, sometimes it won't. Sometimes you'll just be reading it, and you'll be being faithful, and you're reading the Word of God. Nothing's really standing up, but like one week or two weeks later, you hit a situation, and you remember what you read two weeks ago in First Timothy. And, and that, that scripture in First Timothy comes back to you because the Holy Spirit brings it back. You know, and, and then you go, oh, wow. And, and you're able to understand what God was doing for you in that situation and how to get through it because you were faithful to the Word. So, like, being a student of the Word doesn't mean we're always going to be getting massive revelations, but it means that we are retaining things. We're building that retainer inside of us so we can draw from it when things happen. A remaining teachable also means learning more about your area. All right, I know Sailor last year, she um, paid money to... So a course to learn more about children's church, you know, because she, she wants to she wanted to apply herself to this. She wants to be, be the best that she could be. So she, she, she became a student again. She's learning again. We need to remain teachable if we're going to continue to, you know, she wants to take children's church to the next level. So she needs to be learning constantly. Uh, being able to give and receive feedback from others. Now, this is probably one of the hardest ones for us as people, right? It can be hard can be very difficult sometimes to hear how your attitude to life or whatever it is, is um, impacting those around you. Because sometimes it's not what you want to hear. Sometimes it is what you want to hear, and you're like, hallelujah, that can be a relief. Uh, but sometimes it's a little bit of a, you know, actually, I think right now you're, you're nose down. I think right now you are under the horizon. I see the potential in you, and in order to turn nose up, I think we need to make a few adjustments right? Because sometimes if we're blind to that ourselves, we get put in the body, <laughs> right? And the hand will say to the foot, you know, you need to put your shoes on. Um, accountability. That's another one. Remaining teachable. Um, but, you know, I love that word accountability, and I think, like, sometimes that can scare people, the word accountability, but it's giving an account on your ability, right? You have ability um, and those who will keep you accountable are going to say, this is what God has called you to do. This is what he's given you. All right, I want to see you get there. And that, that's kind of around that being able to give and receive feedback again. Um, okay. They're just going to keep jumping because I just did it wrong. Sorry, guys. Servant-hearted. Um, another great attitude to have, um, like I said before, those who humble themselves will be exalted and those who exalt themselves will be humbled. If we are seeking to go up and we want to go straight to the top, we've well, got to start from the bottom. Um, it's not just a song from Drake. It's like, you know, it's life. We have to start from the bottom. And it's, and it's in Christianity, God says, if you humble yourself, I will exalt you. Because I think God would rather have a humble, teachable spirit than a proud, haughty one at the top. You might be full of ability. You know, you might have gifting, like, that goes forever. That rocks. Man, what a blessing. But if your attitude sucks, you know, what's it going to be like at the top? People, like, you know, God says, I, I want humble hearts. And so that means that we serve where we are. You know, you don't just get straight up into, like, big places. You've got to start from the bottom. And everything I did, I showed you this. This is an Acts 20. Paul said it. By this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remembering the words the Lord Jesus himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Right? You know, a lot of people, everybody that comes here on a Sunday morning, um, a lot of them are here really early and they're serving. And they're serving so that we would be able to receive when we get here. But we also need to understand, you know, there's going to be a point for you to give. You know, sometimes you need to contribute to what's happening in the body um, in any way. Whatever that means to helping, helping our clock work, um, we need to get everybody involved. And actually, 
scripture says it's more blessed to give than to receive. And, and, you know, God sees that. And if you feel called to something big, start small where you are. You know, because this is, this is your training ground. This is where God starts plucking out all that, you know, yuck stuff. And, and don't be freaked out when God plucks some stuff out, because he has to. I mean, if it stays, that's worse for you. And for me. Um, pick your battles, all right? Now, we know uh, the scripture in Ephesians 6 that says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the principalities, the powers, and the spiritual darkness, right? Everywhere. So, so we are in a spiritual battle. And I thought about um, David with this one, actually. You know, David, before he fought Goliath, um, he, he went to go give his brothers some food. And as he gave his brothers some food, Eliab said to him, Eliab was his oldest brother who was in the uh, um, army. And Eliab said to him, you've just got a conceited heart. You're wicked. You're this, you're that. Right? And David was like, um... David did respond to him once, but this was a pre-battle before the battle. See, if David had got caught up defending himself to Eliab, right, then he would have wasted all his time on his brother when Goliath was the enemy, right? So sometimes, before we even get to fight the enemy, your brother might show up in your face, but your attitude in that situation to pick your battle is, is my fight against you, because I can see you right now. Because why do you think Paul said our fight is not against flesh and blood? Because we see flesh and blood, right? The flesh and blood is in front of your face like Eliab saying, you've got a wicked and conceited heart. Now it's up to me at that point to pick my battle. Am I going to stand here and fight you, brother, Eliab? Or am I going to move past that and hit Goliath? Because I'm not here to fight my brothers and sisters. I'm here to fight the enemy. And I need to learn to pick my battles. See, David had enough insight in that situation to understand his battle was not against Eliab. His battle was against Goliath. And for us, in hindsight, because we can use that story, like I said, I've read that hundreds of times, but it isn't until you get into a situation like that that the Holy Spirit brings it back and he says, are you fighting Eliab or are you fighting Goliath? And I have to say, hmm, yeah. Actually, David had that insight and from him, I'm going to learn that my battle is not against my brother or my sister. My battle is against my enemy. And I'm going to pick my battles. All right? And I'm going to know them. It's not a flesh and blood battle. It's a spiritual one. All right? And it's up to me to discern from the Word of God. And all those things, humble, learning, remaining teachable, all those things before that, by the time you get to the battle, it teaches you how to do it. Right? And Winston Churchill said this, You will never, ever reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. All right, isn't that cool? Anyone who has had success, right? Because if you live a little life and you sit down on the sidelines, no one will ever know who you are. So when they don't see you, they don't judge you, right? But once you start elevating, right, because God's lifting you up, then people see you more. Guess what? That's when the fingers point. You get the fans, right? But you can also get the critics, And so we need to be able to be focused in those situations to understand that, like, this is just a dog barking. You know what I mean? I'm not going to throw stones at you. I've got to keep going. Okay, because I already know my battle, and I know my call, and I'm going to keep moving forward. So our attitude towards the battle and understanding and having the insight and the discernment to pick my battles properly and realize exactly who it is I'm fighting. All right, your perspective as well. I had just victim and victor. Um, I was like, yeah, people have that victim mentality or the victim mentality, right? Because everybody's had someone do something to us. But if 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 I look at my life and say, I'm such a victim, everybody just keeps doing everything to me. It doesn't matter what I do. If I go into work, people are picking on me. If I go home, this is happening. If I go here, that's happening. And they're just constantly in this victim mentality. Like everything happens to them. You know, and you can have somebody having the same things happen who is like, has a victim mentality, right? And it's like, all of this is happening, but I've got this. All of this is happening, but God is greater. All of this is happening, but I find my peace in God alone. We can have victim mentalities or victim mentalities, but then I thought about this one as well. There's also the villain in the story, right? Sometimes you're the victim, sometimes you're the victor, sometimes you're the villain. 
And if I have that attitude of, where am I in this story? Am I the one rocking things up right now? Am I the one causing the problems and creating them? Because if I have an attitude of learning, I can say, all right, I don't want that position in the story anymore. You know, I, I don't want to be the one that keeps stirring up trouble. I want to be the person on the side of peace. I want to be the person on the side of love. I want to be the victor, not the victim. So your perspective, man, like sometimes just, just you know, that attitude adjustment, am I the victim, victor, or villain? What does the word, God, word of God say about my situation? You know? Is this a roadblock or a road bump? Some people quit. They'll be riding along the road, and then a little bump comes up, and they're like, oh, I fell down. Oh, no. I can't get back up. There's just no way. There's no hope. I just can't do this anymore. And other people hit the bump in the road and they go, oh, that hurt, put a plaster on it, get back up and keep moving. You know, it's like, is this a roadblock or a road bump? Man, I have to understand this journey is not going to be easy and I might get bruised along the way, but like, I mean, I walk with the healer. So it's fine. Am I fearful or faithful? So I could have put the words together, but I think sometimes, I think that's a good indicator. Sometimes we're so full of fear, we're too scared to move. You know, and, and the Bible says perfect love casts out all fear. Now, having, having a bit of fear is natural, right? Why do you think God said, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged? Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. Do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. And Erin picked up on this and claim your inheritance, I think it was. And she said, yeah, there's a difference between being, right, and feeling. So sometimes we can feel scared, but we don't have to be scared. And I'm like, oh, I love that. Because I get scared sometimes. I get fear you know, I have fearful moments, but I don't want to be fearful. I don't want to operate out of fear. If I operate out of fear, man, I'm totally living short of the life God called me. I'm living in a nose-down Christian life, man. I want to nose up. I want my attitude to be one of, like, soaring. Even, even when there's turbulence. You know, even when it, I feel like I'm heading straight into the middle of a storm. I want that perspective. All right, rest. And this is Jesus. Jesus in Matthew 14, 4. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone. So whenever Jesus would go off to the mountaintop, he would spend time with God alone. Um, because he needed that refreshing and that refill and that rest, right? Some of us can be martyred. Like, I call them martyr mothers, you know? It's, it's not motherhood, it's like martyrhood sometimes. You just feel like you give up everything for your kids. You don't even know who you are anymore. You don't get a space to breathe, man. Like, I felt that, and I'm sure, like, heaps of mums have. You're just like, you need rest. Anybody needs rest, though. And rest looks different to all of us. It could be alone time with God. It could be, like, you know, just going to the bathroom by yourself, have a shower, like, lock it. Um, <laughs> nature. Late night drives. I like driving. I like driving by myself because it's like I'm moving. I can put worship on. And I don't know. I like, and I'm by myself. Um, worship. Worship is amazing. Prayer. Like there could be so many things on this list. But it's really important for us to have a good attitude towards rest and not think that it's like lazy or whatever. Like we all need it. We all need that refreshing. If Jesus took it, then we need it too. Okay, so that's having a good attitude towards rest. Um, search me, self-reflection. So, let's have a drink. In light of everything we've said already, I need to, like David, King David, Psalm 139, he says, search me, Lord, if there's any way offensive in me, lead me in the way everlasting, you know? And so I think it's good to have self-reflection sometimes, and, you know, a good attitude towards it. How do others experience me? Does my tone of voice affect others? Like, that's one I've had to think about because I've got a very blunt, loud voice. Like, and sometimes I'll just say what somebody else is saying and it comes across like a knife. Like, you know, I, so I have to think, okay, how can I soften my tone? Because I want to keep learning. I don't want to hurt people around me. I actually want to help them. And so because of that heart attitude, I check myself. Are there any mannerisms in me? Like body language, like sitting there like, huh. You know, or, you know, having those facial expressions. Sometimes you don't even have to talk, but people can see it. You know, in the way you're holding yourself, in the way you're looking at them, your gaze, whatever it might be. Sometimes it's misinterpreted, so don't go around reading everybody. Someone might have had a really bad day, you know what I mean? And it's not about you. But I'm talking about, like, in those situations where it's one-on-one, -on -one, you know, things like that. 
ask the Holy Spirit to help you overcome and recognize blind spots, um, take time to reflect, and dissect feedback given from people. And I say dissect feedback given from people because sometimes, um, sometimes people don't always give the feedback correctly, right? So someone might come in with a bad tone of voice because they're not thinking, how do people experience me? And maybe their body language is one of her and they've got a facial on them. But maybe somewhere in there, there's a bit of feedback that you can learn from, you know, even if they don't give it correctly. So I'm going to dissect the feedback. I'm going to leave the attitude that they had away. I'll pull that out because that's on them. And that's another thing. Their attitude is their responsibility. Mine is mine. And that comes back to that victim, victor thing. Everybody does everything to me. If they hadn't talked to me like that, I wouldn't have talked back to them like that. You're responsible for you. They're responsible for them. And maybe, because I've found this in my own life, when people have really good attitudes and they deal with things better than I could, not because they say to me anything, just simply because they live it out and learn from them. You know, I'll watch the way they handle something and I'll go, I really love the way that they respected that person in that situation. I really like the way that they disagreed in a humble way. I really like the way that they were able to give feedback in a way that wasn't cutthroat, but in a way that was cutting off the ugly, but still maintaining the beauty in the person. And so sometimes it's not even the feedback. I will just watch people around me, and if I see them doing it well, I'm like, that's awesome. I could learn from that. All right? Because our job as Christians is to show the love here and out there. And so I think it's always helpful for us to be like David and say, search me, God. Help me to be more like you. All right, sing a new song. I had this as Don't Look Back. And I put the photo of Chantal and I there because I was a size 8 there. I'm like double that now. All right? So I'm being fruitful and I'm multiplying. Okay? Um, so I, I, I just double who I was. Uh, <laughs> um, but I thought to myself, you know, that wasn't always my attitude to my body, increasing body weight. All right? But something had to change in my attitude. It had to be either my attitude towards food had to change, or I'm like, salad's yum, fruit delicious. Uh, (laughs) That wasn't changing. And I I don't know when that will change. I mean, so I I just realized, all right, that attitude ain't changing. So maybe the attitude towards the size 16 body um, has to change. So now I'm like, only in the last month, I've been like, I'm going to wear whatever I freaking want. (laughs) I'll wear cool clothes again, because I was just rocking around in hoodies, slumping around like... I'm so big, I'm so big, sulking, right? That was my attitude. And, and so what we have to do is, like, we are responsible for our attitudes. And, like, I saw a picture while we were out the back praying, and I, and I just really felt like God was saying, it's for now. Um, like, I saw people building houses out of matchsticks, and they were looking at them as if they were strongholds. You know, like this little matchstick house, and they weren't even gluing it, they were just stacking it up. It was like little kids when they built the card houses, right? And all it takes is just like... And it's blown over. And I think sometimes our attitudes to our lives and the, and the things we have, it's like these little matchstick houses that we've built up in our minds and we look at them as if they're fortresses or strongholds, but really they're not. Really it takes a tiny little adjustment. Like, oh well, I'm a size 16 now. I'm going to go shopping for clothes that fit me. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to still, I'm going to like rock it out. Because that's what I used to say when I was size 8, right? It's easy as a skinny person to give advice to someone who's feeling a bit sad about themselves and they're a bit bigger. Uh, but now that I am the bigger person, I'm like, all right, take your own advice. Rock it. Like, <laughs> change it or rock it. So I'm like, I'm at the point where I'm like, I'm just going to rock this way. It's, yeah, because I love my food. So it gets to a point now where the psalmist says, it's time to sing a new song. All right, our attitude to life. Things happen in our lives, man. Like, you get bigger. You used to be skinny. You're big now. You know what I mean? Stop eating or rock it. Um, well, you know, it's not, not stop eating, but, you know, bad food. Um, so sometimes, yeah, like I said, I was going to call this Don't Look Back. So it's got like offenses, pain, hurt, longing for what was, broken relationships, heartache, mistakes. Sometimes we're just sitting there looking back at the way things used to be. And we can't accept what's happening right now because it's just like, but I used to be skinny. But I used to be this. But I used to have that friend in my life. I used to have that job. I used to this, I used to that, I used to that, I used to that. And we've been living there for a long time, some of us. Sulking, moaning, sad. And God's like, sing a new song. Sing a new song to the Lord. 
he says, the psalmist, you know, he says, man, it's hard. He was honest. You can be honest. It's hard right now. I've got this happening, that happening, that happening. But you, God, are good. You, God, are this. And, and I think some of us need to sing a new song, man. Like, yeah, they hurt you. Yes, they offended you. Maybe that friendship isn't what it was. Maybe you've been hurt before. Maybe you've made mistakes. But sing a new song. It's a new day, man. You're never going to change your life if your attitude remains what it was before. Sometimes God takes people out of your life because they were toxic for you and you didn't realize it. Sometimes God does all these things not with, with us not knowing exactly what it was because he's brought new things into our life. And if, and if we keep looking back at what was, we can't appreciate what is. Amen? I want to live my life a day at a time living for the future, living from victory, right? And enjoying my life. So I hope that helps someone. I really do feel like, though, we could finish with a song, if you don't mind, Teresa. We're singing you song to God, all right? And like, that gentle breeze that was in the house, it's still here. You know, if you, if you want to respond to God this morning, then I invite you to come. Like I said, God's not going to force you, but he's here and he loves you. So that's the promise for you. I'm just going to pray quickly while they come up. Father God, our attitudes are our responsibility. Um, You have given us free will to choose, and you do beckon us to come your way, Lord God. And I just pray that that we would be sensitive to your spirit, Lord Jesus, as you call us on. I pray that we would be um, students, Lord God, remaining teachable, humble. We want to be people like you, Jesus, Um, and we want to go all the way. And we don't want to fight Eliab, Lord God. We want to fight Goliath. Give us the proper perspective to see our lives from your point of view. You're a good God. We can trust you with our lives, and we just want to invite you to um, take a hold of that now. In Jesus' name, amen.